Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy and we're live guys thank you for joining us on another podcast straight video cast and um, it's a real pleasure to be joined by Jana and Hugo who are the co-founders of the restart project uh, coming all the way from their living rooms I think today <laughs> how are you guys doing we're well yeah <laughs> Yeah, pretty good. good thanks. <laughs> so, wh when did you guys start like home working? Ah, uh, um, just about two weeks ago, right, Ugo? Um, yeah, exactly. Ago. Yeah, two weeks ago. Yeah, pretty much. We so we actually guys... did, we went out for um kind of one last team lunch. Um, did so you? Yeah, that was that was it. Yeah, and then it was you know. Over. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Oh, oh crazy! Where did you go? Uh, to a pizza place in Brixton. It was they were really gracious and yeah, it was good. It hit the spot. Yeah. Yeah. And they I guess they're closed now, unfortunately. Yeah. But they've got I mean there's obviously I, I think a lot of these places are still doing delivery and I don't actually know um, what, what's allowed and what isn't, but yeah. Yeah. Nice. I think it is allowed. Yeah. I think delivery is allowed. I think delivery is yeah. allowed. Although I hear people are a bit like cautious of taking food deliveries at the moment, you know, in case yeah. I don't know, handled badly and, and whatever. How how did you transition to, to home working? Was it was it quite easy with the team or um or shall I answer that, Ugo? So we have a fairly yeah. um kind of distributed team as it is. We have two uh, people working in Belgium, um, and then one team member who actually um took the plunge and left London uh last year to move up north closer to his family. So that's actually kind of we've had a bit of like a, a nice transition into um you know a trend more distributed working um cool yeah yeah and we tend to be an organization that kind of is online first in a way yeah. so like we try to document uh so that people can kind of jump in and out when needed um yeah. you know and so i guess it's less challenging than other organizations and i've heard yeah. some horror stories from larger organizations that are really struggling mm. uh, with teleworking and yeah. for us it's a bit different that's true and how and, and, and you go, how are you finding it actually working at home is it something you did before or <laughs> well, is it a bit like, different for you it's different but it's also different because of my current specific uh situation i just had a uh, our second baby uh, oh, wow, just congrats. over a month ago <laughs> but <laughs> right. what this means is like on the one hand, I get to see a lot of him. And on the other hand, I get to see a lot of him. So, <laughs> and, and so it is more challenging for us as a family. And of course, the main part of them, as usual, is not on me. Uh, yeah, I had to readjust and change, use my working hours uh, because it was just not possible with a, a uh, toddler, well, and a, and a baby, it just gets a bit much. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I've got two, and I think um, I'm hoping they don't burst in the room while we're speaking. So if they do, like, we'll just style it out. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's happened quite... before to me has it, today. Has it? Oh, no. <laughs> they run doing like, hey, hey, how you doing? And you're like, you're trying to not to be like, get away, get away, get away. You're trying to be nice because you're on camera. So uh, <laughs> it's a funny one. But everyone, I remember everyone was like, before this happened, everyone was like, I wish I could spend more time with my family. You know, I wish I got a bit more like balance in my life. And then I'm speaking to all my mates and they're like, oh, I can't wait to get home. Kids and like, it's a nightmare. <clears throat> so everyone got what they wished for, but, but did they really want it? It's quite funny. Yeah, uh, for sure. So for it's, sure. Early, it's early days. Um, I think all it, the advice around, you know, trying to keep a schedule is really, is really crucial. Um, yeah. but also just um let's not expect that everyone is going to be working the same amount the same way it's just, it's just so fast. that's true yeah. but then you find actually i found that people often working harder now 
So if they're, if they're not distracted by the kids and stuff, then you've got to remind people to actually take a holiday, even though it's holiday at home, because you can easily, you've got nothing else to do, right? Um, and you can easily get quite burnt out by being in front of your computer or making yeah. the video calls or whatever activity you do. Yeah. You've got to just also remember just to like chill out a bit as well and, and, and take yeah. the time. And that discipline of maybe creating it a separate login for, um, for social and non-working things. Yeah, yeah, Definitely. that's tough, that's tough, that's tough. The schedule's interesting. I've, um, I'm quite strict with my schedule, like I diarize stuff, especially exercise and, and things like that. Um, I find that really, really useful when I'm working at home. That's good. So the restart, the restart project, uh, Ugo, how did it, how did it all begin? Right. So uh, Janet and I both have had a chance to work and live uh, in various parts of the world. In the global south, uh, I lived in Kenya for a few years. So Janet has okay. lived uh, all over the place, uh, from Brazil to uh east timor to mozambique and you know we've been working with activists and with communities uh trying to make the most of the resources they will have and uh, inspiring them to use uh, technology and communications in uh, different ways and then both of us uh, ended up in london and um we we met at one of these gatherings, meetups of professionals oh. working in uh, ICTs for development. And yeah. uh, we, we were both a bit disillusioned around uh, some of the traditional NGO work and uh, also realizing that it was crucial that we do something here in the <laughs> global <laughs> north of the world where people yeah. tend to replace things uh, rather than repairing and using and uh, fully appreciating the value of the things that they already have. And yeah, yeah. that's how we uh, started discussing. And after a long time discussing, we moved to hosting the very first the Restart Party, uh, which was a right. wonderful event, inimaginable right now uh, as when, a when physical event this is in like London in uh, June 2012. First, very first event where a few people met up in a pub in North London and started fixing together. And, you know, Amazing. this is an event that we had imagined, but, you know, until you actually see it in practice, you didn't know whether it would actually happen or not. And people that we had never met came and shared their skills uh, in repairing uh, electrical and electronic products brought by friends and others and uh, that was the beginning and it snowballed all from there amazing amazing and is this mostly like small electronics right so like phones and laptops and stuff like that tablets and yeah the world small is crucial and it's not just yeah. electronics it's also small electricals um so small household appliance kitchen appliance beauty appliances. I would have never guessed that we would see a lot of uh, hair straighteners and <laughs> hair dryers, um, headphones, uh, right. lamps, uh, TVs, printers, uh, you name it. There's a, a huge variety. I mean, we when we started collecting data uh, more systematically about the products that are brought to uh, the events that we organize and the global network around them uh, as you know it started in london but there's people in a dozen or more countries that run events as part of our global network um we started wow. collecting data in 34 uh categories of products including you know from laptops to headphones and uh everything in between and um and yeah so it's really a huge variety of things that people would love to repair but often they can't find a practical or a tangible uh, alternative to finding a neighbor or someone in their community that could share their skills and help them fix it because yeah. a lot of the commercial repair is no longer available or isn't True. practical or yeah. at times it's and, just and too expensive 
another thing that we so <clears throat> we expected there would be like this mountain of stuff that people wanted to fix like we knew because we just we just know from you know living in this world um but what we did not expect was that there were all these people in every neighborhood on every street and every block that really want to repair stuff and help people repair stuff and part of what's um part of um what's interesting for our volunteers is the variety it's like the roulette you know they don't know what's going to come in and it's kind of exciting all the different things that they might learn how to fix and get a chance to fix. Yeah. Um, so if you love repair, it's like instead of um, you know, a lot of our actually a lot of our volunteers do go down the street and they literally pick up um, you know, the fly tip stuff that people leave. But yeah, a lot yeah. of, you know, a lot in London people don't have the space or their partners are like, stop collecting garbage, you know. And so, yeah. so they really love our events because it's basically this, it, it's kind of the same thing except that they get to meet the owner of the device and they get to meet somebody else. And it's a really unique experience for our volunteers as well. It's amazing. So how does it work? So you mentioned volunteers. Mm -hmm. So um, can you just give me a kind of run through like how the events actually work and yeah, and what I, can, I can do that. So basically it's, we don't really have a reference for this because it's kind of like this leaderless, you know, uh, group of people that turn up and help each other. But um, basically, when you come, there's there's usually someone, a couple of people at the door who will help register your device and try and do a like a mini triage, figure out maybe what's failed, um, and then they'll assign you. Um, you may have to wait a little while, but they'll assign you to somebody who has the right skill set to sit down with you and help you. Um, yeah, and then um, hopefully towards the end, we can figure out what the outcome was and get a little bit of feedback from the participant and do a safety yeah. test on the way out. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's the way it works. Yeah. Nice. And how can you become a volunteer? Do you have um, a skill set of some sort? And yeah, we have a we have like a forum and a whole platform for volunteers. They can register their skills at restarters.net. Um, okay. And share the link. Yeah. Awesome. That's really cool. And so, what do you think the issue is? I mean, like a lot of these, like why do you think people don't want to repair stuff first and they just go? um straight to buy something new like for example my phone broke well i smashed my screen like last month and then the back smashed so i went to um you know there's these like phone repair shops in the in the underground i think like ice smash or whatever they're called and they were like it's going to cost you 250 quid or something to yeah. fix and you're like mm. so i paid like i don't know let's yeah. say 500 quid for my android phone plus another 250 I could just get another one for 500. Like, do I, you, you know what I mean? Like, it's interesting that the price to, to fix it is not so different from. But there's another disincentive for you. Which <laughs> you probably, you probably are kind of semi aware of, which is that your Android phone it soon enough will lose software support as well. Right. So soon enough, you're going to lose the updates. You're going to lose the security patches. And yeah. so that also kind of like, subtly erodes the value of your phone for you. Um, yeah. And so so for us, we like to say that, you know, it's usually two sided. Usually the system is probably, you know, working against you and creating all these negative disincentives to repair. But then also yeah. there is a part to it where we've kind of gotten a bit, you know, we, we've become a little bit conditioned and it's partly through these mobiles and electronics to to be like okay well it's just easier to just go online and, and buy another one and what's really yeah. interesting about this moment we're living in is actually it's not easier to go online now and get <laughs> another one you're right. you're right you're right yeah. yeah sadly it's also not easy to be able to find uh, an independent repair business or any business that could help you fix it but um, some of the because, spare parts businesses are still operating, we've noticed, um, some yeah. of the key ones. Um, yeah. and, and there are businesses still operating, yes, um, and, and we need to be a little bit careful also because I think some of them are trying to take advantage of the situation, but but there are still many quality businesses operating, yeah. So, so how would you, so if, so if my phone was broken now, being locked down, what would be the best thing, like YouTube? find some parts and parts on Amazon and then trying to fiddle out how to fix my... I think it depends repair. on what the repair is. So we're helping people to triage repairs um, yeah. together with our volunteers online. And, you know, we really have to be, uh, yeah, we have to be real about what people can achieve on their own at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, so have you now, have you now transitioned from, from like the 
the, the, the live events that you've been building over the last eight years and stuff. And has it been easy to transition to like online? Hmm. Have you been, have you been, like, is it still obviously work in progress or I think how, have you, how have you found it? Yeah. Very early days so far. Um, we haven't hosted one yet. Uh, you know, some people in our extended network have run test events, but it, it's an interesting time because, uh, you know, members of the public uh, might choose to prioritize other kinds of engagements as well. And also like providing the same time of care and personal support that we provide during a physical event is is not really immediately possible because the whole point of our events is repairing together as opposed yeah, yeah. to Female just time. telling you yeah, yeah watch this video and do it yourself and so the level of confidence that you can help if yeah. literally yeah. you're holding the device together and learning how to disassemble or take apart a product right and and yeah. you cannot replicate that uh, entirely on online. Uh, so we're looking at like potentially kind of more asynchronous approach. So getting people to send us problems they have, um, triaging them in the in the time that our volunteers have online because they're also super busy working from home. Um, and then yeah, like working through it with people. Um, but a lot of them have come down to wow, you probably do need to find a professional near you. Um, yeah. And so. Yeah, we're just trying to figure out how to how to work work all of in, your, in your like in your uh, obviously you're both very successful entrepreneurs and you've been in it for a long time, right? Eight years is is a is a great is a great time to be running a company. Is this? Do you think that the, the biggest challenge you both have faced running a company? Um, well, we're a charity. <laughs> I mean, technically, we're a charity. Um, we social call enterprise. Social, social enterprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enterprise, but. Um, as much as from the beginning, we really wanted to be scrappy and um, bootstrap and make money. And, and very much we did in the first years when we were lean and hungry. Um, we were, I guess, suppose we were more entrepreneurial. We, we ended up, um, you know, like many, um, raising institutional funding to pay for the work. Um, you know, as much as there's this talk about, you know, social investment and investment in um, social enterprise. Um, ultimately, and in these investors, they seek an immediate financial return that we just weren't necessarily able to um, to provide. And I guess our mission was more the system change piece, so the campaigning yeah. piece, and that you know there is no ultimately there's no business model for that work. So we it's have a, work, yeah. a lot of yeah institutional fundraising, and actually we've been really lucky in terms of. Um, at this moment in time, our funders and our funding is really appropriate to the situation. And a lot of the work that we are planning on doing, we can carry on doing. Um, yeah. So, but it is, it is an interesting time for charities and many charities are facing, um, you know, huge uh, constraints and questions about their future. It's yeah. interesting what you're asking, uh, Louis, because I think like the bigger challenge uh, was years back when we had to make the case for all of this yeah. and uh, in a way all of a sudden i mean it's not just this particular event but there's been a series of uh, realizations for people that you know repair is essential and should be at the heart of the way we look at the economy and yeah. you know like climate change uh, starting to be too late a wake-up call for people and there isn't enough questioning of the way we consume yet but it's certainly we don't have to explain why is it that we um, help people relearn repair skills and why we help them think differently about what products they're buying and whether they are repairable to yeah, begin with true. yeah yeah no, i think it's great because it's interesting like a natural uh let's say a natural disaster like like what we're facing at the moment is quite humbling right you realize that you know in the face of a, of a natural disaster from mother nature like there's nothing you can do and, and all of this consumerism and stuff just it, it it kind of falls by the wayside almost it gets you thinking like you know i've got no idea how to really survive if it all goes goes down i know my way to sainsbury's but I don't know how to go and hunt and survive and what mushrooms to eat in the forest and 
how to fix the stuff I've got at home, right? I've got probably got plenty of stuff at home, plenty of electronics to keep me going. But even though I did a science degree and I probably should know how to fix stuff, I've, I've got no idea. You know, you kind yeah. of lose the skills when you don't use them. Um, yeah. And what would be interesting is, is if people, if this goes on long enough, will people's habits change, you know? And will they start to, to get more into fixing stuff and not using stuff as much? That would be, uh, be quite interesting to see. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a bit of an open question. I mean, I, yeah. I had an interesting experience the other day, like trying to help a vulnerable uh, neighbor who um, couldn't get the landlord to call it, couldn't get the landlord to bring in an electrician to, to fix some of the light fixtures. So she's literally in the dark. And uh, there I was, you know, on Ikea. I mean, me of all people, I feel ashamed, but you know, we needed a budget <laughs> lighting option. So there I was and I was like, oh, this looks appropriate, you know, add to the cart. And then you get to the delivery <laughs> window and you're like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, actually I need another solution. So um, we got a lamp off of Gumtree and um, right. a, really, a really kind uh, person, you know, delivered it to us like that, you know. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really gets you thinking, w will I think the same way, you know, next time I need a, an, a budget emergency lamp, you know? Yeah, Gumtree's great because that's all reused, like old stuff, right? People's people's things that you can use and recycle and and those things. Yeah. eBay's yeah. the same. I mean, they they're great actually. Certainly in times like this, um, I found also there's a lot of in my area in London. I'm in Islington. There's loads of Facebook groups now for the different postcodes, mm -hmm. and so people are like, and the WhatsApp groups as well. Like, um, we've got a spare loaf of bread. Does anyone want it? We yeah. have a spare, or does anyone have? Yeah, no, so, and it's I like. I mean, I really love this uh, paradigm of mutual aid because, really, ultimately, that's what inspired the restart party. Was um, you know, I would worked in Brazil where they have a they have a they already have a word for a collect a fluid collective of people that help each other without a leader. You know, it's called mutirão. The mutirão, and it comes from um, Guarani indigenous culture, or ultimately. And um, and it's just funny because if you think like I, I remember asking like early days I've I've been in the UK for maybe twelve years now my mom's British but I needed to kind of learn um, and I asked you know is there something like the Muchiram is there something like is there like a in, in the British social operating system like does this exist and I remember people telling me oh oh that's that's the Blitz spirit <laughs> and I was like yeah. no but that's a long time ago. The blitz for it yeah 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 it's really it's uh it's really um it's interesting because i think what you find is like the silver lining in in these kinds of things is that your kid's really sweet by the way <laughs> <laughs> um well one of the silver linings is that you know when everyone has a shared experience you know like the countries right really people pull together you know yeah. it's really it's yeah. really cool um and that's what we had in the blitz and um that's probably what we're having now like every human on the planet is thinking yeah. about this situation right now and it it's funny because yeah. london as you'll know right when you come to london if you've not been born here or lived here for a long time it takes quite a while to tap in yeah. you know despite having family people it can be quite lonely people are busy they're working they're you know it's, it's quite tough and it takes a bit of time to find your your thing but now when something happens like this suddenly the community comes out yeah and everyone you know the keep yeah. calm and carrying thing from the wall it does it does make you think though it's like um that we and when we run restart parties we do often have this um people come and they have like almost like a like an emotional response or like um or some people also um sometimes people come with other needs that are not about the electronics. Um, and what you can tell is that we, that we don't have that many spaces on a recurring basis. Um, maybe because we're a highly secular society, um, we lost some of the kind of like meeting spaces or coming together spaces where, you know, there's, there's no, nothing required of you. Um, and it's all just out of, you know, just for the, it's for the greater good. It's for like, it's for human connection. Yeah, sometimes yeah. people feel like they, they wonder what's the catch, <laughs> whether, you know, like at one point they will be asked to to pay or why is this happening like this in a 
open yeah. way with no questions asked and you can bring you know whatever like you could be coming for whatever reason and uh yeah i remember meeting someone uh, in london who <laughs> works in finance uh, and uh you know after listening and being kind of really impressed with what we do at one point he was asking me but do you really think that this needs to be a not-for-profit initiative like why what are you doing and so it's like yeah look you know it exists in this way because it exists in this way i mean it's not we're not trying to like create another exploitative environment where people uh, are coming because of a service. You know, people confuse uh, the types of efforts often. You know, we're trying to rebuild connections yeah. and uh, give some hope. Actually, yeah. one volunteer doing these events um, in Hackney, uh, Bridget, uh, wrote a wonderful blog post about the importance of yeah. giving people hope and particularly this time and so, she, said, yeah. um, she quoted some eco philosophers whose name i'm going to forget but she said that <laughs> um that hope is something you do and not something you have and um I, and I, I really like i definitely agree with that and um yeah the, the other thing is i think like radical openness um is something that we don't really practice enough of and i think you know oftentimes like um you know, in the tech space also, and we say, um, this is a diversity initiative, or we're all about open, this is open night, everyone's welcome, it's open, but are we really, like, meeting people where they are, you know, are, rad being radically open, I think, means, it means more than just opening the doors, and, you know, making yeah. a call out, and, and that's, yeah. like, that's our challenge at our events as well, I think it's constantly a challenge to, to, to yeah. truly be radically open. But I really, I think what, what, what your thing boils down to is like random acts of kindness, you know, yeah. like, like people um, coming to come into your events with a problem and a complete stranger saying, hey, don't worry, I'm going to help you fix it. And, and I don't want anything in return, you know, apart from maybe some conversation and, you know, that's it. Right. Like, you know, people need to be kinder to each other. And these things you know, enable that, I think it's, it's really cool. And I, and I, and I, and I hope again with, with the stuff that's going on now and even before it's like, you know, people can just be a little, if the people are a little bit kinder to each other, it will just make the world, you know, that bit better. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think what you guys are doing are beautiful, you know, and it's, uh, it's people being kind to each other. It is. And there, there are challenges. Like, so one of the things that might be fun to, we, we should also say that it's, you know, like there's a challenge to create this social space, right? So a yeah. lot of um, a lot of our volunteers are super skilled and they are motivated by giving their skills and sharing, um, yeah. but they're not necessarily good at uh, kind of narrating or creating that you know so social bond with you know with a total stranger out of the blue. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there is also some work that has to kind of I think uh, people they over time they learn um, how to do that, but initially. Um, a lot of people do get really engrossed in the technical challenge in front of them, and we yeah. have a challenge of making sure that it's that it's still a social um, experience and that and that the participant learns something as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I, it makes me want to like learn to fix stuff again. Like it's quite a nice thing. It's like when, like in chemistry at uni, and like the great thing is just you're like kind of following. You know, it's it's technical. You're you're following a, a, a way and all those things. Also, remind you, did you ever read the motorcycle diaries? Mm. Ah, it's do funny. You know so, wait, do you mean um, you don't? You're not talking about Persik's book, but the Che Guevara, the book about Che Guevara. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got a copy in the bookshelf there. Don't ask me to to bring it out, but um, yeah. in fact, there it is. Jen, oh no, do you know what? I'm I'm actually mean this. I'm gonna get it. So, <laughs> Um, not not that, but I mean Zen in the art of motorcycle that's maintenance. Because yes. yes. there, are, yes, there are some funny stories in the motorcycle diaries about what was she called the motorbike? But um, but anyway, yeah. I watched, was... you know, I watched that as a film, and then I read I read this book. So this is by Robert yeah. Piercy. Yeah, yeah, this Zen is an amazing book. book. Amazing book, and it kind of reminds me a little bit about <laughs> what yeah. you guys are up to. Well, it's funny, I just published a kind of like um, 
uh, what I'd call maybe like a feminist 21st century remix of, of him um, talking oh, about huh. like the empowering part of repair as well um, and kind of yeah like the, the way that um, sh you know that challenges like well it, it empowers people and, and empowers them essentially to challenge power structures and the patriarchy and everything so I I appreciated that too because I feel like um, sometimes the books that are written about craftsmanship and repair and are, well, a lot of the time they're written by men. So, um, but yeah, that is absolutely a reference. And I think, oh. Why are they written by men? Why are they all written by men? I mean, there's an issue, uh, there's a gender issue, I guess, more broadly, like in 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 the professions, in this, um, the, uh, the way people get qualified and learn skills, yeah. Um, a lot of we have uh, we we're actively seeking out women repairers and you know kind of recruiting them and working with them, and a lot of them do tell us that um, that they really that they, one of their greatest regrets is that as girls they were not as involved in you know in in their dad's hobbies or in um, in the kind of technical world that they saw in front of them, um, yeah. and so a lot of them are kind of like compensating maybe and that one, uh... as adults yeah. But as a percentage how many of your volunteers are women i would say it's roughly maps to the kind of percentage of of engineers which is which is roughly like one in ten um in one in ten group. one in ten volunteers are women yeah. wow yeah interesting um and in other so we don't fix you know clothes and furniture and other things um but some repair groups do and there yeah. you have a very gendered kind of Sadly, a very gendered split where yeah women are teaching people how to fix textiles yeah um, the things and it's nothing against that it's just that we really want to see women represented in what with batteries and plugs and electronics so yeah, yeah. interesting that yeah i mean it's a, it's a choice i guess women make earlier on right to do the science subjects or yeah. arts i've got two daughters so it's going to be interesting to see what they navigate to i mean i yeah. love science my wife works in the hospital as a physio so we're, we're, we're both like yeah. science -y. um it'll be interesting i get them involved in my in my hobbies and yeah i don't know yeah. it's interesting i'll be yeah. uh be cool to see what where they end up well but. there's there, there is a question about like what you know i guess with women in stem more broadly like is it a pipeline problem or is it a problem like later on and i don't i think there's there, there are the two parts of it. I think I think girls do leave technical subjects earlier than boys, but I don't. I, but I think at this point, women are actually quite represented when you get to higher education. Let's say, um, but whether they stick around and whether the incentives are there for them to stick around seems to be one of the bigger questions. Yeah, it's also personal choice. Like you tend to find women don't prefer going into those types of subjects. Like if I think of my my social circle um i mean m most of the women and and i think they all did better than the guys at university for sure um went for more arty type subjects or certainly the jobs they chose there you go is that's the question of of, of like where does that oh, that's from? not the pipeline question well, I think, absolutely it's probably yeah. i think it's probably ultimately a little bit of nature and a bit of and a bit of nurture right but what about what about the, the structures though like that, that are around them like there's so many other questions about you know how easy it is to to like to be a woman in technical fields um, and to be promoted and and I, I mean I don't know I don't pretend to know all of them but I think there are some also just kind of systemic or structural issues there too. Um, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think in the UK, you know, out of out of any country in the world, I think my daughters could probably be and grow up to be whoever they want to be. Yeah, you know, yeah. like they can choose different things. I think uh, there's definitely been been like structural problems also, I guess like role models as well. There's not many like female role models to look to in those subjects. Yeah, well, and I've also heard it said that it's, you know, that it, that uh, men find it difficult to role model for women sometimes and, and like, because perceptions or whatever that sometimes even when there's a lot of men who want to help role model and mentor women, it can be kind of problematic and can create its own problems anyway. Um, but yeah. it seems like for us, um, we've noticed that um, if we kind of cluster women and get them together, so at our events, if we um, if we create kind of just like you know like a, like a little 
gang of, of women in the corner that are that are all repairing together. They're visible and they're part of the event, but they kind of hang out together. That, that yeah. really helps. Um, yeah. it, what do you think about it, Ugo? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, there we've made uh, some mistakes and actually there is the risk of kind of creating an exclusion by trying to be inclusive um, rather than, you yes. know, like um, <laughs> inspiring people to do what they want to do, but not like set aside from others. So like our more successful attempts at bringing and supporting, bringing together and supporting women repairers has been actually like not like making them part of like bigger events that we run and um and uh, and having the right amount of support so that it's uh that they feel an extra incentives to but i would also say i would defend we also have uh skill shares for women and non-binary people and i think mm -hmm. it is a good space like i think we should have the both i think we oh, should sure. kind of create a, a space for women to, especially to get to know each other to get started but then also um, let's be together and be visible at the main events. And that, I think that's what we're going to be doing going forward. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. and actually the see a cluster of women uh, or non-binary people involved and at fixing together, they can be a force of inspiring yeah. other women that come maybe just because like some help with their appliance, but actually might think about how they could get involved themselves otherwise also, they wouldn't necessarily be able the, to see that. the girls and the, and the and the kids that come they definitely they absolutely need to see women repairing um and getting technical as well so it's good yeah no no i, I mean yeah what you're doing is awesome what i find just really interesting and we're never really going to know the answer to this is how much of it is is genetic you know like having having two girls has been interesting because like me and my wife, you know, we were like, oh, we're going to give them lots of different like gender neutral stuff and like they can play football and they can play and they can do ballet and they can do gymnastics and they can do, you know, those kind of things. And and I love science. I've been uh, well, certainly at the moment as we're at home, there's loads of cool online science stuff and music, and dance, whatever. So I'm trying to like expose them to as many things as possible. Right. But obviously, like as a as a parent you know full well that your kids spend their whole lives trying to unlearn, unlearn the things that you try to teach them. Um, so you've got to also give them the space to make their own choices. And so it's just, a, I think, fascinating just to, you know, how much of it is, is, is what is the nurture, like the environment I'm creating for them. Um, and how much of it is like, hey, they're, you know, they're born with it, the DNA. Yeah, innate i don't know whether i'd say genetic but yeah innate characteristics innate, yeah yeah like i it's like my in my house for example my brother like the first thing that he you know that that, that is left from his creations at preschool was you know a plate with the milky way galaxy that he had drawn on you know at age three or something you know yeah. and I, I definitely was i just wasn't drawing the milky way galaxy yeah. that is just that's just so when did when did you get interested in in this stuff like has it always been yeah well that's so you know yeah so for me um i grew up with my uh, super technical brother um he was older and so for me there was a lot of the kind of uh i guess there wasn't it just it just didn't occur to me to become technical i was just more of a social person just like from from very early on um, but, and also I could just get help often. And then there was a bit of that kind of, oh, come on, go on, just, uh, can you just fix this for me kind of thing. Um, yeah. and so I, I mean, I got really interested in the, what technology could do for us. Like, you know, I really got interested in the early internet. You know, I, you know, I coded some websites in HTML in the late nineties, but nice. I was never interested in the physical side of technology. It just, it was just a, a almost like a thing, you know, yeah. um, and I think I became interested more as an activist or more as like a kind of, damn it, I'm going to do, you know, to make a point of this. So I'm going to, um, yeah. I feel like Ugo, you were a little bit more geeky and hands-on by nature. I don't know. Is that yeah. fair? Well, I guess, uh, well, my, I received a computer and played with it with my father, I think at age six or seven. And, right. you know, it was an old uh, Texas instrument, one of those with cartridges and uh, that you could also connect like a, a, a tape uh, player to load right. 
softwares to it and you had to be careful about how what volume in the tape player was not too high or too low otherwise the computer couldn't read the software in there like it, it was a whole other world you know pre floppy disks and um, and i guess i i've developed a fascination with um helping others make the most of this equipment that they had like i remember helping friends um sort out the low ram memory availability so that they could play their video games i will go to friend's house and somehow <laughs> okay, uh, that's tweak cool. some files yeah. so that they could uh, free the memory from their that's technical. That's or yeah. <laughs> early windows versions you know the didn't you also, windows didn't you, i feel like you 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 were like you were in student government and you were involved in some procurement campaign yeah. related to equipment or something yeah like that. so there was a time you know when <laughs> students i guess it's true now but i'm on the receiving end as a much older person now but you know back then uh we knew a lot more about computers compared to the teachers and the people that were supposed to make right. decisions so i remember actually for my high school um helping decide what computers should be bought and look in a procurement document and you know now fast fast forward 25 years later uh we're looking at what computers should be allowed on the on the market based on whether they're repairable or not and what kind of procurement public institutions should put in place to prevent unnecessary waste which i guess is you know like at a very different scale it's some of the same ethos apply so yeah definitely someone yeah. needs to tell apple to make their phones to last longer i'm sure didn't they get caught out somewhere there was something that came out saying that they any yeah, yeah so there's been gates. all yeah. kinds of um yeah, yeah uh, battery gates and all sorts and they've been fined uh in italy and france by the antitrust authorities although peanuts a uh, little money for them and yeah. uh, a class action settlement uh, much more substantial in the us although nothing really that can change the behavior they're more like reactive measures so and that's why um part of our work has evolved uh, into campaigning for a, what we call a universal right to repair so that you know manufacturers should be a lot more um, transparent about the limitations of their products and also yeah. make them much easier to be repaired and not fact, exclusively my, by themselves. If my image earlier in this video was like stuck, like it's because <laughs> it's because I was like beach balling. Um, and I, I, I'm one of those people that I have a MacBook air with four oh. gigs of Ram soldered on the motherboard and that's it. That's I. There's no upgrade oh. for me. I'm you need to you go round to upgrade your RAM. I'm stuck. It's, it's soldered on. I mean, there's only like one guy in Taiwan who will do it for like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I mean, this is not just an Apple problem, but it's a, an example of some of the um, situation we're now stuck in, and that's why we ask for regulation to help change the scenario because everyone is stuck into this situation where products have become more and more miniaturized and as yeah. a result of that often or as an excuse for that um, manufacturers choose to solder components that in the past were never uh, soldered, uh, such as ram or uh, a hard drive or a solid state drive into the main board which means that in case that was component was to fail or if you wanted to upgrade it because all of a sudden you realize that you need a computer with twice as much memory you're no longer able to do that and you need a new one that's never it knew that. yeah. never knew the, that. the keyboard the infamous keyboard on the macbook wasn't it? you know yeah. the 700 pound keyboard where you had to replace the whole top case the whole thing on the top yeah. Um, so there's there's numerous examples of it, but there's also and this is something we're watching is that um, companies are increasingly using software locks um, to prevent yeah, so, repairs. So wasn't so on don't Android? I'm sure I got a message saying if you've got an old Android something or other, you, you're not going to get the security updates mm -hmm. and yeah. So there's this issue that uh, particularly uh, in the Android ecosystem because Apple on this front 
the census of its products for longer, uh, for okay. five years and at times longer than that. Right. But uh, although we'd love every phone to be supported for 10 years, why is it that a smartphone is supposed to last two or five? You know, it should be up to you to decide uh, when it's appropriate to upgrade to a new one. The amount of spare phones I've got in my, <laughs> in my desk is like ridiculous. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, like the, the main issue is that as part of the um, Android ecosystem, not even Google itself supports officially its smartphones for longer than three years when it comes to security updates, which, and in fact, often they interrupt at a completely arbitrary time. And that sends the message that this is it and you should upgrade and get a new device. Um, there's been other approaches and, you know, it's possible to support a product uh, for much longer because um, free and open source alternatives that are very hard to install and take right. a lot of time uh, actually can make use of the same code to support phones for much longer period of time. And Fairphone, for example, has been uh, able to support it's for just, five years. But yeah, we just, need it uh, as a standard. Yeah, definitely, because most people can't be bothered. Like, sure. you know, how yeah. do I go and how do I go and install it? You know, no, it has to be understandably easy. It needs to and be easy. One of the things we fear is that um, because the mobile is like this new paradigm for um, you know, you look at it and you're like, ah, oh, it's three years old. You know, um, <laughs> and what we what we fear is that that is going to become the paradigm for other product categories. Like um, now that your smart television, you know, needs it needs updates, it needs patches. Um, are we just going to treat the, this gigantic TV screen, which has a huge impact in production, like we treat a mobile? Like, whoa, uh, three years gone, just throw it on the pavement. You know, and, and when it's physically still fine, um, yeah. and this is a real threat coming forward, is all of these smart, quote unquote, smart um, appliances and uh, things, is that um, if they become physically, if they become, you know, they become unusable because of software, then we have a big problem. And then there's, yeah, a, yeah. there's another aspect to the repair, kind of the right to repair piece, which is around um, manufacturers using software to lock down components. So for example, um, there yes. are chips where, where we suspect that Apple could just at any time decide to lock them down and keep independence from, from replacing them. Um, and this is something we're really watching with great care because it could really yeah. undermine repair. Hundred percent. On the positive side, uh, Tesla. Um, so really, the first car that um, offers soft software updates, right? So often the things with cars is people change them, but actually quite a lot. You know, mm -hmm. send your leasing and stuff, and the world certainly going like the leasing way, right? Less people are going to be owning cars. Maybe it's actually you're going to be sharing cars, but uh, at some point in the very near future. But Tesla do um, like regular software updates. So um, so I think that's great because you'll end up changing, if you have a Tesla, for example, or something like it, as more cars go that way, you'll end up having to charge the change the hardware of the car less as the companies start to start to update the software and they could probably actually then make money selling extra stuff via the hardware updates i think this you know there's some cool stuff i mean you yeah. know would you mind if 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 apple or android would try to sell you a cool update for yeah, uh me, like, if, if you, if mean, yeah so if they're saying that look we can't afford to we can't afford to update you after a certain period then then we should think about okay are we willing to pay for for that update um, yeah. the answer is in my case, probably yes, but, um, but we should be offered that. I think I agree. Yeah. 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 But like they need to start. build for the future. And I think that's what we're seeing is that, you know, the, the, the business models need to radically change. Um, and that this, this hasn't really reached the C-suites of these organizations yet. They're, they're still, I mean, they have talented engineers and designers who are absolutely up to the challenge tomorrow. But until they get, until, you know, from a leadership level, the business models change, we're not going to see this. And so that's why, you know, for example, a Tesla is, a, is potentially, you know, a good example of, and I don't know all the details of what you mentioned, but I can imagine that because of the kind of the, the culture and the leadership, 
they're they're willing to entertain these radical changes yeah 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 definitely what will what's quite interesting though is psych people's psychology and yeah. and you know like someone sees an influencer on instagram with the new iphone for thousand dollars or thousand pounds you're like i want one like people are just people just buy yeah. them right yeah I, I know a friend of mine lives with lives with her, her flatmate her flatmate lost her phone uh so broke i think it was so broke her phone it was repairable but she was like no nah, no nah, I, I want the new one it's I, is, I want, it like, is it like our, it's like our hunting and gathering you know it's like hard hard wired stuff there. it's weird yeah. right it's like it's like if i say to you like whatever you do don't buy the new phone you're thinking oh i've got to buy the phone i've got to buy the phone i've got <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> But it's also true that the same doesn't apply to the vast majority of other appliances. So That's I think true, yeah. even people that tend to get quite obsessed with their phones, they're, they're still... Like, oh, new toaster, they're still... awesome! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not just about, you know, the you know some of the scary stories about how the smart uh, appliances might decide yeah. to shut you out of them and not let you use them for a one point, just randomly. But I think that there's something about the smartphones that, you know, in retrospect, in a few years time, probably we'll look back and say, well, that was the anomaly. Because for many other things, even people that might be a bit like yeah. excited or excitable about uh, a phone upgrade would totally yeah. be happy with using all of their other things for as long as possible. So let's also not yeah. um, you know, get I'll, too I'll, like sidetracked by that. Yeah, and like the Sonos, the Sonos scandal, <clears throat> I don't know if you heard of that, um, but the Sonos scandal around um, them kind of dropping support, I think that was really kind of a sea change moment because what um, I think what some of the tech companies realize is, oh, wait a minute, people actually really do want to keep some stuff. <laughs> and they're going to be really upset if we force them to bin it. It's yeah. it, so I, I think um, I think Google is right. I think we I, I think that and I was encouraged by the, the, the backlash to Sonos on that. It wasn't just it wasn't just like you bastards. I spent money on that. It was this just doesn't make any sense. Like it's bad for yeah. the planet. It's bad for yeah. me, you know. Yeah, I hadn't realized uh, how big that would be. Like the fact yeah. that, you know, like I thought it was just geeky music fans, but actually it's been huge. The amount yeah. of, uh, I mean, it forced Sonos to go for a soft U-turn and, you know, like it's actually still improving. I mean, even the very fact that they, remove this uh, feature, so-called feature, to brick their device when it uh, was sent to them. You know, when they were suggesting that people could uh, mark a product for recycling. And, you know, by doing that, no one would ever be able to reuse that product again. All um, right. And it was prepared for recycling, right? Uh, by making it impossible to be used again and, and that that's gone that feature no longer exists they've updated silently at one point the operating system so that you cannot like do that again which is a, which is an interesting side yeah, development yeah. definitely that's great i also remember apple changed all their connectors like a few years ago right big uproar about that but everyone still bought them ultimately yeah, yeah. That's annoying. <laughs> We're we're not so a lot of people are concerned with the universal chargers and connectors, but we're, we're we've got our eyes on the prize. We're more interested in you know design for repairability, okay. um, you know this the, all the stuff we've already just talked about because we think that yeah. that's really where the and and that's where the the companies are going to push back so hard um, is on design for repairability, um, repair documentation, um, you know, and access to affordable spare parts. They're absolutely going to push back on those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what you guys are doing is great. I mean, it's, you know, you don't even think about it. Um, you buy your phone, you don't think what the repairability is like, or you, you don't even think about them designing it not to be repaired. I mean, you know, it's a great thing to highlight and, uh, and you, you, yeah, really good work. Really good work. Thanks. Right. Thanks for having us on your on your show. Pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in. I'm looking forward to attending one of your events live yeah. <laughs> in London. Or yeah. if you do one online, um, mm -hmm. please let us know. Um, yeah. What's the best place for people to find you and, and see what you guys are up to? Well, um, you, our site is therestartproject.org. 
and yep. uh, we are very active to Janet, particularly on uh, Twitter at Restart Project, and we're on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, and uh, all our work on the right to repair is on repair.eu because we're launched um, together with partners a campaign, European wide campaign, uh, to push for right to repair in legislation at national and European level. So uh, follow us there as well. Amazing. Well, we'll put all of that in the show notes. And Janet and Hugo, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, yeah. Stay safe, stay healthy. And I look forward to seeing you both in person yeah. and live yeah. at some point soon. You too. It was Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you for having us. Bye. Pleasure.